Okay, Seamus, you've made it. You had a little bit of a detour, which we might talk about quickly, because it actually goes into the first thing I wanted to talk about today, and that you didn't grow up around here. You learned to drive somewhere else. Is this your third December crazy Aubrey turns to a shit show driving exhibition? Yes. Yes. yes, (laughs) Is this the worst you've seen or? I tell you what, I'm not on the road often. And when I am, it's off peak hour. And so I actually don't see a lot of traffic. One thing I love about this town is that the road rules, no one notices if you're a bad driver. Like, uh, I was coming into an intersect. I was coming into a, a roundabout in the way in, and I I didn't stop in time, and I almost encroached over into the path of an oncoming car. Nothing. Didn't even acknowledge me. Didn't care. Didn't phase them. And I gave him a bit of a wave, and I was like, "Jesus this is a beautiful city. No one cares." I went. I went, and um, I dropped a friend off the other day, and I I I, I was driving, and there was a an island in the middle of a T intersection. So I couldn't turn right. I looked around. There were no cars. So I just went around the the island. And I'm like, geez, I love this town. This just doesn't happen in any other city. No. (laughs) So we're here with Seamus, radio host, aspiring comedian. I'm just going to put that out there. Or at least doing stand-up and entertaining young fellow. He got a little bit confused about where I was living. I've actually moved. And I was feeling pretty happy that I managed to get out of the CBD of Aubrey Wodonga today because I had to go buy a small cable for these headphones and that involved going to South Aubrey. <laughs> so the pro- to progress from South Aubrey all the way back through the CBD to get to where I am now, it was like uh, growing up dodging cars without the fairy floss soft drink. <laughs> it was, yeah, it wasn't good. And I was like, wow, people are losing their minds. Yeah. But Crazy what is it you. about... The goal is to make it to Christmas. Yeah. The whole family's there. Yeah, and it everyone- Shouldn't the goal to be do, to do that as safely as possible so everyone is there, not lose your mind? I know. But you're doing this every day. It's not like it's unusual. You don't just drive in December. I know, I know. People lose their marbles and they think they're invincible in cars. And coming into the end of the year, itchy feet, ants in the pants. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, it's actually really sad how many people die coming into Christmas. But it's over by two o'clock, Seamus. Christmas doesn't even go a whole day. (laughs) Yeah, everyone's (laughs) wasted by then. It's done by two. (laughs) You drive it like a maniac for two hours. Yeah, I don't get it. But so I, he's made it all the way over to the house now and I just thought, wow, an extra, let's just say, so we can't geolocate too much where we were (laughs) and where I am, maybe an extra 35 minutes worth of driving on a day where you probably don't want to be on the road. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. That's doing it for the pod there, mate. That's it, buddy. Well, <laughs> the funny thing is I was actually I was actually meant to be in Wodonga because I went to meet a lady because I'm going to, after this, I'm going to go back there and I'm going to pick up her placenta in tablet form. <laughs> and tomorrow on my brekkie radio show, I'm going to eat her placenta. <laughs> right. Okay. Isn't that messed up? Well, that's maybe the most... I could have wrote a list of 20 messed up things that wouldn't have touched that. I know. And I was like, oh, it's on the way to his house. It's fine. I'll drop in there first. I'll suss out how weird this is. And then afterwards, you know, and then I was like, oh, crap. He doesn't live in Wodonga anymore. Well, two things. The first, next time you actually want to say that, can you not leave such a big gap between pick up placenta? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was hanging. I was hanging there. I didn't know what was happening. And the other thing is, did someone talk you into that or no. did, did this offer come out of the blue? I I reached out to her. So uh, we've come across an article where this happens all the time. There's always an article about eating your placenta yeah. and how healthy the health benefits it has after you give birth. So I came across an article and I was like, geez, let's get a placenta on the show. Let's see it. I want to taste some. And so I reached out to her and, uh, yeah, she's going to give me a placenta. Isn't that odd? That's Beyond odd, mate. Like she a- showed me photos of what, how, like the placenta she gets before, and it's like a slab of meat. She's like a butcher turned into a drug dealer because she chops it up and then and then dries it out and then crushes it up and puts it into little capsules. Sorry, she self purified this for you, or does this get done somewhere else and then it gets sent back to her? She has a business where people deliver their placenta and she does it. And then she gives it back to them. 
250 well, bucks for well, 450 pills. So, I mean, as a dealer, that's some good return. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going into some murky moral territory here. But <laughs> let's just keep going for a sec before we get on to some lighter yeah, stuff. Yeah. What's the profit margin like on something like that? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, well and what sort of kickback to the people sort like basically her suppliers, quote unquote? Mm-hmm. What do they get out of this deal? Well, she. Or do you get do you get those back for free and then the excess? So you- if I'm a client, I would deliver my own placenta, and pay her two hundred and fifty dollars, and I get back like a portion of a year's or oh, longer, like three years worth of tablets. And apparently, the health benefits are through the roof. I said, what's it going to do to me? She said, if you had six, you'd clean the whole house, you'd not be able to stop talking, and it would kind of be like you're a bit high. And I'm like, no. What happens if you smoke it? (laughs) (laughs) So, the house here is quite clean at the moment. But if just say it's not, (laughs) if I was to like just roll you maybe an eight... (laughs) Eight or twelve. Eight or twelve placenta pills. Seamus, just watch the spill in the corner. We yeah. don't know what that is. <laughs> wow, that's I wasn't expecting anything remotely like what that went. Yeah, that was yeah, that's yeah, interesting. The- so I'm gonna pick them up after this. Yeah, okay. So let's just give some context for what time of the day it is. It's about seven ish mm-hmm. PM daylight savings, so the sun's still up. But by the time this is done and you get over there again, it could be Let's just say quarter to eight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're basically going into twilight to speak to a person who you now kind of know a slight bit better mm-hmm. to pick up placenta tablets. Mm-hmm. Have you thought about the theatrical nature of what's about to happen? It's a bit. It's definitely a bit strange, isn't it? And it's yeah. it's a little creepy and verging on cannibalism. It is, and we're also going to have to find a Spotify playlist for you <laughs> before you leave. I don't know, I'm not sure if you can search that in Spotify. <laughs> yeah, placenta playlist. It's the placenta pickup playlist. <laughs> yeah, that's good what stuff. What the hell? Right, so now I wanted actually to talk to Seamus today about the fact that he's been doing a bit of stand-up. And it's something that, to be honest, I've never really seen around here. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously, the region attracts bigger comedians. Mm-hmm. And when, particularly if they're in the middle of a strong hype cycle, they do sell out. But I've never seen a local level comedian, mm-hmm. like a comedy scene scene of any kind. Yeah. Well, when I first moved here two years ago, it, it was almost non-existent. It, it, do- it did exist very loosely. Uh, at one pub and I got up a few times there but it was pretty quiet and not well known and now now it's a lot it's growing it's only been happening for the last five months but uh, it's growing and a lot of people are getting around it and the numbers are staying consistent which is really impressive two things had you ever been up before in your previous stops through either through radio or television or just in general was it something you thought that that's I would like to do stand up and the people that are also performing these nights with you, are they experienced? Have they been, obviously there was no local scene, but were they performing out of town and now they're actually able to here or are they getting up for the first time? Both. Initially, just experienced comedians, not even locally. Uh, the organiser would bring them up from Melbourne. Okay. Yeah. And they were good, you know, quite yeah. good comedians. They're, you've got to be at least margin. You've, you've got to be good to get up down there. Yeah, it's like so powerful the scene in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah, and and we're talking, you know, paid comedians like this is their job. So so the, the 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 standard was quite high, but now since it's got a bit of a name for itself, you know, they're starting to do open mic and and people are jumping up, and uh, you know, it's it's developing a lot of interest and it's definitely planted the seed and it's it's definitely growing, and um, there are actually a lot of local comedians uh, and some a lot in Wagga. There's a really big scene in Wagga. Yeah, I've been talking to a few on Facebook that yeah. I want to speak to when I go up there. I'm making a little trip up there soon. So. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's definitely growing, um, but I I never considered myself a stand-up comedian. I still don't. I just only – I never wanted to be one. I don't want – but I used to watch stand-up comedy as a kid watching De- Eddie Murphy on Delirious, and then I, I, I just – obsess over watching it and I love it. I love it so much. But I've never actually thought, oh, I'm going to try and make a career out of it. I just like doing it because it's fun. I've uh, My first one I think I did when I was about 21 
And every so often I'll do it because I think it, 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 as a performer and a radio host, it kind of, it helps, it assists in your, it assists in my delivery on air and it assists my performance and my performing ability. Yeah. So we won't, we won't venture too much into the radio stuff. If you want to know more about what Seamus has done there, you can check back to episode two or three where we go into that more deeply. But is there, obviously, do you think that the stand-up helps the radio more than maybe the radio helps the stand-up in terms of which way the creativity is flowing sort of thing? Or? I think radio helps stand-up 10 times more than stand-up helps radio. Oh, yeah. Because in radio, you really learn how to hook someone in straight away with what you're talking about engage them and develop a, a break, a talk break or in stand-up a, to develop the joke and then finish high on an out. And because you do that 13 times every day, you know, you really learn how to um, you do it. You yeah. really learn how to do it quite quick with so many different news articles. So my approach now to stand-up is of a really high standard of myself. Yeah. So I will... I see this all the time when I see comedians get up. They're quite self-indulgent and they'll tell a joke and they'll take a long time to tell it and they'll assume that everybody's holding on to every single word that they're saying, but they don't. No, no one cares. No one cares about what you're saying. You've got to make them care. Yeah. And and that's only something I learned in radio. And since, you know, I, I, did, I, I was doing radio for about a year and a half before I actually jumped up on stage and- yeah, my performance on stage was 10 times better than last time I did it three years ago. Yeah, right. Purely from my radio experience, yeah. People out there, obviously, that it's hard to tell, you know, how those things work. Like we talked before we got on the mics tonight, we were talking about your Marty Sheargolds and your mm-hmm. Mick Malloys where they, they're so at home in both mediums that it doesn't sound like a stand-up guy on a radio station yeah. or a radio person that happens to be on a stage. Yeah. There, particularly Marty, because he's just a comedic genius, genius of yeah, the highest is. order. Mm-hmm. But he does very much what you're talking about. That his skill is the pause, mm-hmm. which I think probably is something that served him well on stage, mm-hmm. leaving people in the discomfort, and also knowing when to get out. Yeah, because I know because I'm quite, I can be quite long winded, and mm-hmm. I like to know that there's weird details in the story that might pay mm-hmm. off at the end. That's the thing that scares me most about ever getting up. Would you ever do it? Would you ever do it? I think I would, but I'm not sure whether... And it's something I think someone might have described Andrew Denton this way has been pretty funny. People just... He walks in the room and people just think, oh, that's the funny guy. He's yeah. a funny human, so I'm yeah. going to laugh. I don't have that kind of humor to me. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand yeah. what you mean. But I don't think that's overly important. I mean, it can assist. If you look funny, sure, you've got it. You look funny, whatever. But if you don't, I think, let's use Will Ferrell, for example. He doesn't look funny. He just looks like a normal guy, right? But what makes him funny is he acts like a child or, he, yeah. you know, he acts so immature, yeah. which makes it funny because he looks like a banker or a teacher or, you know, a stepdad. Yeah. But because he's acting in a certain way that is so ridiculous, that's funny. doesn't act how he looks. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm strongly considering giving it a go, just getting up. Because I do have a couple of pretty funny stories that I'd like to tell. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think, yeah, I, th- I mean, it's one of the biggest adrenaline rushes that I've ever had in my life, ever. It is huge, man. Yep. That feeling when you're up on stage, oh, and then you get off and you can't remember. You can't remember if people <laughs> laughed or not. It's the best feeling ever. And if people laugh, it's the best high ever. Yep. It's the weirdest thing to explain. So that's all great, but I think tomorrow morning with what you've been talking about, you might top everything you've just said. So, Eating someone's yeah, placenta. Yeah, the placenta. What is. the hell am I about to do? I'm not sure whether you can type that into Uber and get that delivered. So I think that where I was actually, it's funny you said getting people laughing and you kind of don't know. That's how it always felt for me when I played a really good gig. If I played a really, what I thought was a really great show on the guitar mm. those were always the ones where people were a little bit like oh, i was a bit lifeless mm-hmm. but if it was the ones where i kind of just disappear and go somewhere else yeah 
And then at the end, I'll be thinking, geez, did I play anything right? Yeah. Was any of that what I was meant to be doing? <laughs> Those were always the gigs where people would be like, wow, you guys were on a different level tonight compared to normal. Yeah. Well, I think, so the last, in the last two months, I've done two stand-up gigs, right? Both roughly 10 minutes each. The first one I did, I had a routine that I knew worked and I just wanted to nail a 10-minute routine that I knew worked, right? And I basically, I memorized this thing verbatim so I could say it with any distraction and I just knew my mouth would just mouth the words, right? And I was happy with it. It was great. But I felt the last time I did stand-up comedy, I grew as a comedian. Now, the routine wasn't as good. The jokes weren't as funny and I didn't get as many laughs. But what I did is I got up with brand new material and I stopped. I was in the moment. I enjoyed the presence. I listened if people laughed. I listened if they didn't. And I was in the moment when they didn't laugh, I didn't freak out because I didn't care. And I just enjoyed playing with the material. And a lot of my friends commented and said, you were so much better in that one because you were natural, you are more real, and you're enjoying yourself. And I think that's the difference. To get that right, I think there's a certain scale of your current ability and your taste. Mm. You know, normally, there are different ends of a very long pendulum. Mm-hmm. You want to be over there because that's what your taste tells you. Yeah. Whether it's on radio, there's the big guys, you know, once again, Marty Sheargold's and the geniuses and Hamish and those type of people within this country that are just straight up geniuses in Mm -hmm. the medium and then there's stand-ups that are also, you know, they make up what I would call taste, but then everyone's ability might be over completely at the other other Hmm. end and you've got to cover that chasm. Well, that's right. Like like I said before, I grew up watching Eddie Murphy on Delirious and Dave Chappelle. and All-time heavyweights, yeah. Exactly. You know, and recently I've been obsessed watching Richard Pryor and I've watched Dave Chappelle on Netflix 10 times each. But they're amazing. You know what I mean? And, 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 And when I get up there, there's no, like I'm not even remotely close to as good as them. And but you know that's they're my taste yeah. compared to my ability. There's a large yeah. jump to go. <laughs> yeah, but I think getting the obviously if you've got your whole life to write a couple of jokes, mm-hmm. there's funny stories, there's things that you know every person I've ever told that to they laugh. Mm-hmm. So those first few shows are bound to be funny. Yeah. But then there's a period where all you've got is your own confidence to sit in the fact totally. that maybe these jokes aren't world beaters, but I'm going to present them as though they are. Totally. And they could be. I mean, I've never done it, obviously, but it could. That period's going to be longer, yeah, than you, than you want it to be. Well, in my experience, the first one is amazing because you are so nervous, you put so much effort into it, and it's really well written and rehearsed, and it's tight. The second one, you've got so much confidence because he made them laugh on the first time, it sucks, and you bomb so badly, and it is the most horrible feeling on stage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you've got all this confidence. You're like, ah, oh, it'll be fine. They laughed, so I'll, they'll laugh again. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> they do not. I'll tell you what, you know you're alive when you're up on stage and you say a joke and no one laughs. <laughs> it's that feeling, man. You, 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 oh, and you get hot, the spotlight's on your face, and you just you want to die then and there. Wow. It's the best. <laughs> I go through that every day at work when I use a couple of words that people don't understand and they look at me blankly and I just think, Jeez, I wasted a good joke there. <laughs> it might have been rubbish. It probably was because they didn't react. That joke's so bad, I'm not even going to wonder what those words were you used in there, Josh. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> right. so just completely off topic, but I want to make sure we get this and after Seamus's little detour, I don't want to keep him too much longer. <laughs> so there's a few things I want to get through. The first one is, and I'm sure you guys have come across this, and it's probably been a thing, but I haven't had anyone to talk to this about because if I presented this, because I'm seen as a serious person, mm. I would have got, what are you asking me that for? But I know that you'll be on board. Okay. Did you hear during the week that Australia is full of NASA actors? Yes, I did. Have you had a chance to go through that with anybody yet? Because I haven't. I I've haven't. just been thinking that the flat earthers have just taken their storytelling up a level. Yeah, I know. This is Hollywood level storytelling. But how arrogant of them. Like there's 20 million people or so in Australia yeah. and they're just excluding all of Australia, which, by the way, Australia completely sucks the dicks of all of America. And they're just ignoring us completely, saying, you guys are all actors. It's like, at yeah. least tell a few of us so we no, can be in on the joke. There's two things that I want to bring up. One, if that's the case, I don't think you can work for NASA unless you're a US citizen. So we actually are US <laughs> citizens. Yeah. So they better think about that. And the other thing is, 
I'm pretty sure when you're an actor, there's some kind of union fee for every day you're on the job. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not seeing any of that. But like- $200 I've, per gig. I've often thought of this Truman Show concept where everybody's in on it. And I just think, you know, those like one-on-one conversations, like for example, now, just say we weren't recording and we both knew we were actors. We'd be like, wait, what are we doing? Like, I, like, can we break character just for a moment? Do you want to talk about what we just saw on the street? Yeah. Like we'd all have to be in on it forever. Yeah. And just think about, maybe not so much you because you're probably surrounded by more creative people on a daily basis than I am. Think about how many god-awful boring conversations you have. If someone's writing those lines, they've got to be better than that. Yeah. like, like Every time the- you have a boring shit one, you're like, that came from the writer's room. Yeah, and they work for NASA. Like, this is supposedly yeah. the smartest team like in the whole said, world. People don't understand the words I say. Surely. Yeah, these guys, man. When they're minimum requirements advanced calculus, <laughs> they don't get stumped on a word with yeah. more than two syllables. Yeah. The flat earthers might be wrong. Yeah. I've just got a feeling. <laughs> Yeah, just put it out there. The no, thing- I do. I I didn't read anything about it. I just saw a headline and I was like, "What the hell?" Yeah, these are these things come up all the time. I still don't understand how someone can actually think the the Earth is flat. Yeah, I I get it, and you would know. There's that long bit between Taylor's Bend and Adelaide, mm. where you may <laughs> be able to convince yourself that is the case because that is flat with a few weird looking little alien plants. Yeah, but yeah, I think you only need to look. Either way from where we are now to know that the it's, horizon kind of drops away. There's a curve, man. There's a curve. There's a curve. <laughs> yeah, that's some crazy shit. So I did notice that you've been – you're looking fitter than last time I saw you. Thanks. So Was I fat the last time? No, you weren't. <laughs> no, you weren't, you weren't at all. You just yeah. – I mean, I say that knowing with context that yeah. you've been posting on Instagram that you're working out more. Yeah. Or maybe harder. Harder or more or both. Why no inspirational quotes? Because they're lame and really annoying and every yeah. time I see some fit inspo quote from some untalented, really attractive girl in active wear, I just think, shut up and I want to unfollow them. I wouldn't I don't like inspirational quotes. I think they're dumb. No, I was gonna congratulate you. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> every single person that's remotely fit now. Yeah. Just mashes thirty unattributed quotes yeah. together into one sentence, yeah. not, and contradicts themselves three times in the process. I know, and it's like, what's Buddha got to do with you know how much you can squat at the gym? Yeah, very little. Yeah, very, <laughs> like Buddha's got no, like Buddha's like got sure, nothing sure to do that, with it. I'm sure Buddha could lift, <laughs> and he's not there giving you a hand. Yeah, and Buddha's probably the wrong Buddha, guy. Like, <laughs> I need a spot. I oh, know. Yeah, he's not helping you. But like. He was massive. He's got a really fat gut to rub for good luck. Like, yeah. well, he's not, you're not finding him at the gym. Yeah. Like, just imagine him trying to do a side plank. He's just rolling up, <laughs> go back down. He'd never get up on his side. Yeah. I just appreciate seeing someone that's working out, not posting total psycho babble bullshit on Instagram that actually has a following. Like, yeah. I could go on there and do that. Believe it or not, I used to be really fit. <laughs> I, I know it sounds hard to believe, but I was. And I don't think at that point I even had an Instagram. Yeah. But I just wish that I'm going to start posting photos of myself as though that's me and basically just seeing how much inspiration I can bring to the world. As someone who is a creative themselves, how do you think that would go down? I think you'd lose a follower in me. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't do it on my own account. (laughs) I'd call it at at douche pencil or something. (laughs) Douche pencil. Yeah, it wouldn't be me, surely. (laughs) Yeah. Do you know what I've noticed though? Since so I, I stopped working out I, for the last two months, my life just went upside down. I, I was sick. I moved house. I got out of a relationship. Like it was just horrible, right? And I just comfort ate, and I bloomed out a little bit. And now, the last two weeks, I've been working out like crazy. But I have found since being single, chicks dig the dad bod. I'm like, so guys, stop working out because they don't actually care about the large pecs and the six pack. Yeah. Like get a bit of a gut and a bit pudgy and chicks love it. I don't get it. I do agree with you. And when I was at my fittest and people that are listening to this, if, if they know me, they know it's true. But if they've met me since I've been unfit, they're like, he's lying. He's lying. <laughs> it's but, a lie. Yeah, it's all lies. But I had a girl who I was seeing say to me because we were – I was I was overweight, then I got fit, and then mm. we, she actually said to me, "You're all hard and pointy now." Mm. And it wasn't. I took that as being a compliment at the time, yeah. and I thought back, oh, no, no, that wasn't a compliment. And I actually saw. It's funny you bring that up. 
there was some study about dad bods. But the problem about the dad bod is, and I very much do not like to use this term, and I'm sorry for anyone who's offended by this, but it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope of you're going fit guy or regular guy, mm. dad bod perfection, and this is a pendulum and you're only in that yep. middle once and the other the rest of the time you're swinging to one end or the other. You hit dad bod and then you hit what I hit. Formerly fit guy, dad bod, <laughs> which is fat over muscle and it still doesn't look too bad. And then there's a big slip off after that. Yeah. And just... you, you can't, you can't, you can have the dad bod, but you can't have the dad bod mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I You've got to have a slightly more self-critical dad bod mindset. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like a weird, like a, a weird balance. Like how do you maintain average body? You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's basically no yogurt. <laughs> Farmer's Union strawberry, one, yeah. one cup. That's where you want to be, one cup per day because that'll give you all your biomes, yeah. et cetera. But then you go past that to one litre. Yeah. And then an extra two litres of ice cream a day as well. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah, they're not that far apart. Yeah. And you can just get stuck yeah. in a fucking soup of ice cream and yogurt. <laughs> and I mean, it's amazing. It's the best yeah. time of your life at the time. Yeah. And I really enjoyed putting on this weight. Until I got to the point where I was like, wow, it's really, really hard to lose it and it's stop so stop it from going on. What I don't understand is unless you are a professional athlete or a bodybuilder, you don't require no, you don't. such intense exercise. You don't require abs. You don't require this intensity, this up first thing in the morning, having someone yell at you and this, this crazy lifestyle where you can't eat fun things. I'm like, listen, unless you are a professional athlete, or a bodybuilder and you're aiming towards something as your career and you get paid, why are you doing this? Who cares? What are you doing this to yourself for? <laughs> I agree with you so much. That's why I haven't even committed remotely to thinking that I would go back to being yeah. a fit person again. And the funny thing is in my fitness journey, I used to be so like the reason why I worked out was so I could, you know, uh, look good and pick up chicks. And then and and then I... I got quite mus muscly, right? I looked quite good. And then I took like three months off and I went back to just average looking. And then I thought, what did I gain? Nothing. So since then, I have wanted to change into learning a martial arts. So, you know, yeah. just say you do it intensely for a year. You don't do it for three months. You still have a, you know, a relatively, you still got a level of skill yeah. where you can, you know, you've learned something instead of just lifting weights. Yeah, that's it's very funny you say that because after I put on a little bit of weight after I was, you know, formally fit, mm. he, my dad said to me, because he knew that I loved reading, mm. he said, you realize that every minute you spent in that gym that counted for nothing, you could have been reading a book that would stick with you your whole life. Yeah. And he's not exactly a profound person. My dad's an old guy from Corium. But he said that and I'm like, you know, you're right. All that knowledge might help me one day with something and I'm not going to lose that. Whereas all that's of that right. working out. As soon as I stopped, I started to lose it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I saw a guy at the gym who in between sets would just have a massive book and read for a bit. Wow. I was like, this is interesting. Training your brain, training your abs and your gut. Good. Learning. And was, was, it a, was it a workout related book? No, it was like a thick like Lord of the Rings looking thing with like so I've got, a, of, I've got a couple of tomes up there. Do you think I should? Uh, <laughs> yeah. What have what I got? <laughs> I've got Bubbles there by Peter Slotersvik, which is a p philosopher. Do you reckon I just roll into the yeah, gym with that? Yeah, roll in with that or anti oh, anti-fragile. Jeez, <laughs> how dumb do I sound? <laughs> Given that's upside down and anti-fragile is a hard word to read upside down. Can I tell you something about anti-fragile? Yeah. The, the concept of anti-fragile is that the stresses, which we can call you just stuffing up the yeah. nose, then lead to strength. Really? So it's basically the idea of something that benefits by actually being exposed to stresses. So that, you've just proven the whole point. You went from not knowing the name yeah. to feel like a dickhead yeah. to knowing the name. And you can even take that book home if you want. But oh. There's about five before that to understand what he's talking about in that one. So Amazing. Yeah. That sounds so cool. Take that one to the gym. It feels good to actually have the... One of the bookshelves up and up and at it. I yeah. think last time we were in a little basically lifeless room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll just have one more thing and then I'll let you go get placented. <laughs> Why is it that social media knows so much about us? And I mean, in your line of work, you would know that the social platforms are powerful, even if they're not as powerful as people think. Everyone, it's like a collective delusion that they work in business. So mm. we all have to be on them. 
because to not be is stupider yeah. than to yeah. be on them. Why was it that neither Facebook and or Bookface, <laughs> the Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, none of this knew that my one of my favourite comedians other than Bill Burr is Ronnie Chang. Yeah. And it wasn't until Netflix put Ronnie Chang's International Student in front of me, which came out 18 months ago, mm. or however long. It was made in 2017. It might not be that old. How come it took Netflix to know that I might like that show? Think about the amount of crap that Facebook is sending at you on a daily basis, and they can't get something right that I actually do like. Yeah, yeah. Mate, the it's Big Brother. They're watching. They're listening. Have you, have yeah, you noticed They're not that? doing that very well, They're not Shavis. doing it very well. <laughs> they need to up their game. They need Turn to- Turn it up. I can't hear him. <laughs> Is he saying Roddy Chang or Chug? What's he talking about? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think they've stuffed it there. They need to um, maybe- uh, What's his name? Mark Zuckerberg has stopped selling to Netflix all the data from everyone. Possibly. And he's finally into trouble by the government. Yeah, so Netflix kind of snooped it for themselves. Yeah. They're like- Ronnie Chang's done shows with Bill Burr. This guy's yeah. rated all the Bill Burr shows 100 out of 100. Maybe he wants to see that. Yeah. And he's also in Australia. Yeah. But all these monolithic companies can't figure that out. I like his page. I yeah. love him on Twitter. I retweet his shit. And at no point do I get an ad. Yeah, it's like, give me more ads, people. Come I on, need to ABC. buy things from Ronnie. <laughs> Even if it's ABC iView, I don't expect Ronnie to be pushing the ads. Ronnie's got shit to do. Yeah. But ABC iView could at least come to the game and push at least one Twitter ad to me. I'm a bit disappointed with Netflix at the moment because they... Wow, well, this, this might be even more moral trouble than the conversation yeah. we had earlier. Let's go there. So Netflix have been promising me a Ray Romano stand-up special for a year now, and they still haven't delivered. If you search Ray Romano in Netflix, it'll come up with coming soon in 2018. Mate, i only got two weeks left. <laughs> They've been promising it to me all year. I can't wait to watch his stand-up st- special. That'd be amazing. Ray Romano's Christmas Deluxe. Yeah. Doesn't really have a ring to yeah, it. Yeah, it really doesn't, no, does it? No. So he's basically looking at 2019 now. Basically, yeah. Or I don't understand why you can get awesome things on American Netflix and not Australian Netflix. Like there's one called Lily Hammer that stars yeah. uh, the- Everyone loves that show. Yeah. But is that the one with the mafia guy from Sopranos? I haven't seen it. Oh. Well, I've only heard about it through all the comedians I listen to in podcasts. Why the hell can't we get it in Australia? Why is it only available in American Netflix? Yeah. It's just all these rights issues of people like Fox own a lot of stuff, like Fox Tell. Yeah, they uh, they own the rebroadcast. SBS do all these other companies in this territory. Their licenses are still current for all of those properties, and Netflix can't have it until those licenses have expired. But it makes the Ooh. product itself just seem not very satisfying. Well, yeah, because I go to Netflix sometimes, and I, it feels to me like it's YouTube. Like, I should be able to type anything in there and get something, even if it's a little chunk. Yeah, But every time I get zero or I get thrown, the other day I was looking up, I was trying to watch, see if they had the extended editions of Lord of the Rings on Netflix, Mm -hmm. and then all I got pushed was seven and a half versions of The Mummy. (laughs) (laughs) Like, they needed Did you know there was a half movie? (laughs) Really? No, I'm joking. (laughs) But there is. It felt like the whole screen was just The Mummy, 47 it's like, no, guys, I wanted Lord of the Rings, like not yeah. the mummy. Like, I don't want Brendan Fraser, okay? Yeah. I want Frodo. Yeah, that's it. It's slightly different in quality. Go yeah. I, I think Netflix will do – so it, people are going off free-to-air and onto instant streaming services. But the biggest problem, and I know I'm not alone here, is when you sit here on the menu on Netflix, you stare at nothing, there's no sound, a lot of them don't have trailers. I think at one point – it's going. There's going to be a box in the top right hand corner of Netflix that has a 24 hour streaming of just whatever they want to put in, whether it's trailers, whether it's a series, whether it's movies, and you can click that channel whenever, and it'll just turn into free to air on Netflix, like the same schedule of yeah, just playing stuff. I think that there is a network that does that because, but, but I can't remember who it is off the top of my head. It's a great idea because. If you – and the thing – I mean, they, they're t- always testing different – you know, if you leave it on, I think, or at least on the PlayStation 4 app, if you leave <laughs> it if you leave it on something long enough, it'll start to autoplay the trailer. Yeah. And they're always experimenting Netflix with different covers. But I've skipped over th- something a million times. Like, I'm a big fan of the book series, the Shannara Chronicles, or mm-hmm. Sh- Shannara, and there's a TV show. Not the greatest show. Very, very attractive ladies, but okay. not the greatest show. I skipped over that for 12 months. 
Really? If there was something up that was running through Netflix and just said, hey, if you happen to think, do you realize that this is the Terry Brooks novels come to life? One time I would have went, okay, I'm on that and I'm watching the whole thing. Yeah. That's all. I needed someone to actually tell me yeah. what, is, what is behind that fancy cover and behind the shitty trailer that they decided to put I know. Up. They're really dropping the ball in that area. Like, think about it. Every time I go to watch Netflix, it's when I've made dinner, I want to sit down, I want to eat, and I want to watch. And I'm scrolling through the menu. My dinner's cold. I'm annoyed. I just want something to watch now, and I can't decide. They just need a – I think our viewing habits will go back to the 80s. Back to the 80s. Well, the 80s and 90s where you sit around and you all watch a TV that, show together. Well, sounds like a dream, but – I'm not sure if it'll go back quite that far. Probably not because that far. of the the bad synth music <laughs> and the haircuts. Yeah, yeah, the haircuts. Well, gosh, <laughs> I was what I'm a massive Terminator fan. It's one of my favorite franchises, and even I love the first two movies so much. Even those movies that I love so much, I can't watch any, particularly the stunt actors, because they've all got mullets that are half mm. an inch longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like okay, that's the stunt mullet. Do you think it's weird that they brought Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the second one as, like, it was the same character? Like, he's the same guy, but they brought him back as a different character? Or have I missed the mark there because he's a robot? He was a series of robots. But in the first one, he's Arnold as a bad guy, yeah. right? And then the second one, he's Arnold as a good guy. And it's like, that's the same guy. It's something my older brother said to me, which is interesting we're going here. In the movie, they phrase it <coughs> as though there would be some familiarity mm. to that character. Yeah. That it was so weird that it was the same object that went, because John would have seen the television footage of when, like, the, yeah. the, from the previous movie, he would recognize this character yeah. for whatever reason. Or maybe he wouldn't, but there would be some familiarity. But it just sounds like future John was playing a big-ass practical joke. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's send back the exact, because all they are is just, they grow the skin and the muscle over a, like just a generic machine. Yeah. So out of all of the potential options to send back, it could have been Gary Busey, it could have been Hakeem Olajuwon, the yeah. basketball player, yeah. it could have been anybody. They decided to send back the one machine that tried to kill his mother. Yeah. Well, it's so warped. Yeah. Hey, mum, yeah. remember this guy? <laughs> He's not trying to kill him. Yeah, he, trust me. He's, he's really good now. Yeah, he's a good guy. Trust me. Let's look after him. Bring him into our home. He doesn't want to kill you anymore. Like, believe me. Yeah. It just reeks of like the reason why they did it is because, well, Arnold was a massive star. The and biggest he, in the world and, at that point. Yeah. And he's going to bring in more money. Yeah. But nowadays, like, he also, we just want to buy that. He, James Cameron did say that he was so surprisingly brilliant at playing a robot. <laughs> Just he basically went into method actor level yeah. robot. Just his lack of emotion, the way he would stand and move, etc. Apparently, it was just next level when they saw how he was going to play the Terminator the first time. And so they're like, "We've got to bring him back." Yeah, major plot hole that they've just overlooked, though. Like it's well, yeah. it, it baffles my mind. Yeah, let's just scare the fuck out of our yeah. mothers. <laughs> let's bring him back. Yeah, good times. Right, mate. Well, I've probably kept you long enough. Thank you so much for joining me again. Uh, is there anything you want to plug while you're here? Obviously, you stand up. Or is there anything else that people... I would encourage people to follow your Instagram. Yeah, follow my Instagram. Because uh, you Evans. have one of the more interesting inter Instagrams for... What did I just watch factor? Because yeah. sometimes it's just... <laughs> it's almost like a little quiet scene in a movie and then suddenly a guy's <laughs> bashing through a door <laughs> and then it just goes away. Yeah. With, yeah. with work, like yeah, I so finished... Shock and awe value. Yeah, at, with work, I finish it like midday every day. So I get home and no one's doing anything. So I'm bored and I'm on the couch and I just get so bored. And when I'm, I'm like a child, if I'm bored left in a room, I'll just get yeah. up to some weird things. Righto. Well, thanks once again, Seamus, for being my second return guest for the first one that's done two full episodes. I really appreciate you making the time, mate. No worries. It was fun. Awesome. Uh, you can go to punchingsideways.com. I've had a few people ask me what punching sideways means. Basically, it means that we're equal opportunity bashers here and people say comedians punch up and politicians punch down while we're punching. We're punching sideways. Sideways. <laughs> so hopefully that makes sense to people because clearly from the artwork, it kind of doesn't. It's <laughs> just, just my head in an illustration. So, righto. Well, thank you. Thanks, Seamus. Thanks, man. 